Um, good. And I hope you're ready for another exciting conference day, which begins with a great keynote. Our keynote speaker today is Melanie Johnston Hollett. Melanie is an astrophysicist. She's the director of the Murchison Wildfield Array. And also, she's a professor at the Kuschen uh, Institute of Radio Astron Astronomy at the International Center of Radio Astronomy Research. And she has spent quite some time of her career um, with the design, construction, and governance of major radio telescopes. These devices, they produce massive amounts of data. So, Melanie knows to handle a lot of data, and I'm really excited to hear about how to do this. So give her a warm welcome, please. All right. Oh, it works. Very good. It's always strange to hear yourself through a micro microphone. So first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to come and give this keynote to you all. It's my great pleasure to be here in New Zealand. Um, some of you may know that I actually spent nine years in New Zealand uh, working on the SKA project. And so today I'm going to tell you about that project. I'm going to tell you about big data and astronomy and some of the challenges that we face uh, uh, in that regime. I don't know that we've solved everything, so I'm not sure I'm going to give you all the answers, but uh, I'll tell you what, what we're up to. So every field that people work in today can be classed as big data. So whether you're dealing with uh, e-medicine, so medical records, where you're collecting huge amounts of information about individual patients over their lifetime and then trying to come up with predictive uh, and better tools to understand health records and predictive health for people, or you're dealing with banking and transaction records, which is an enormous uh, field of global data curation and creation, or indeed if you're just dealing with... Uh, Transaction records for your company. So Z Energy here, I use this photograph because they're an energy transport company here in New Zealand. They have the largest transactional database record in the country, which I was astonished to discover. So this is you go to your petrol station and you buy petrol and they're collecting all this information but not necessarily extracting knowledge from it. And so I think every field that anyone works in, we're now facing this question of what is big data, what do we do with it, and how do we make the most out of it? I'm just gonna adjust this a sec. Right, so, is that still working? Okay, cool. All right, now, as I was introduced at the start, I'm a radio astronomer, and so I wanna to talk to you about perception of big data to start with. So I work in the field of big data in radio astronomy, and if I talk to people generally, they have this perception that big data is a complicated yet interrelated and structured set of information. So most people believe that big data looks like this. And you guys work in semantics and ontologies, and so you understand how to overlay it and hopefully make it look like that. In reality, in most fields, big data looks like this. So this is actually an exhibition which was given in Barcelona in 2012, and I, I think it's very perceptive. So it's just a whole bunch of magazines chucked on a floor. And when I talked to Z Energy about their uh, transaction database a few years ago, they kind of said, yeah, it's a bit like this. So they've collected all of this information, but they've not turned it into a knowledge extraction system. And I think that's really the challenge that we have in whatever discipline that we're dealing with. Now, radio astronomers are particularly greedy. So we're motivated to understand the universe, but the way that we're doing that is through collecting enormous amounts of data. And our challenge, just like all of yours, is to turn that into knowledge. So, as was stated in the uh, introduction, I have spent 20 years working with radio telescopes. I was trained in Australia in radio astronomy research, and I never thought that I would be standing here talking to uh, people at computer science conferences or on the semantic web or anything like that, because when I started doing radio astronomy, I just wanted to understand the universe. I didn't want to understand how radio telescopes work or how data is actually transferred into knowledge, but that's, that's how I ended up here. And so these are some of the telescopes that I've used um, in my career. Uh, and just, I'm going to point, hopefully this works. This is the Murchison Widefield Array. This is the telescope that I'm the director of. Looks like kind of metallic spiders. We'll come back to that in a minute. But these are the sort of standard instruments that I'm sure most people are familiar with. Now, 
when I give these talks, I always, always want to dispel one myth for radio astronomers. So I hope you'll indulge me in this. So most people, when I talk to them about what radio telescopes do, they don't think that radio telescopes make very beautiful images of the heavens. They think that radio telescopes listen to the universe and that they make horrible contour maps. So if you take nothing away from this talk, please take away that that's not true. This is an image made with my telescope, the Murchison Widefield Array. This was actually made uh, here in New Zealand when I was working here by one of my postdocs. And what you're seeing here is a section of our galaxy, the Milky Way, seen in three radio colours. So everything that you see there as a blue uh, colour, that's actually hydrogen gas. So those are regions of hydrogen gas sitting in this section of our galaxy, the Milky Way. This is home. Everything that you see that looks like a circular yellowy blob, that's a supernova remnant. That's the remains of a star, which has died in the most spectacular way. And everything else is the electrons that fill uh, the magnetic fields that sit in our galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is an image made with a radio telescope. So radio telescopes make beautiful images. So please, please, please remember that. Take that into the world. You'll be doing me and all of my colleagues a huge favor. Um, this sort of image is what got me into astronomy. I wanted to make images like this, and so I thought I should be an optical astronomer, but it turns out that I can do it with a radio telescope, which is kind of neat. All right, so radio astronomers want to understand the universe. That image that I just showed you has a huge amount of science that we can extract from that, but it's not my job to tell you about that science here today. My job is to tell you about the processes by which we try and extract it. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is that we are always trying to build new telescopes. We are very, very greedy. So in the last decade, we've spent $10 billion on uh, astronomy infrastructure, and that's not unusual. It's actually quite cheap compared to space missions, but this is ground-based stuff I'm talking about. So the pinnacle of this renaissance in radio astronomy, which started about 80 years ago and then didn't do very much until the 70s and 80s and then is now going through a renaissance, is a project called the Square Kilometre Array, which is going to be the world's largest radio telescope. Now... The SKA is an instrument which is designed to create the fastest frame rate, highest resolution movie of the evolving radio universe ever. And those of you who've dealt with video and movies know that that's a huge amount of data. So this is a machine, which I'm going to tell you about, uh, built in two parts with two types of antennas, which is uh, going to produce prodigious amounts of data which we then have to extract knowledge from. So, these types of antennas here, these are called offset Gregorians. Um, they're going to be placed in South Africa, and these things here, which look like Christmas trees, are actually low-frequency radio telescopes like the Murchison Widefield Array. So I'll come back to that in a sec. All right. So no single country can build a telescope like this. It's going to cost of the order of a billion dollars uh, just to actually build the hardware. Um, that's not including any of the compute processing that we have to do offline. Um, so it's currently being built by a consortium of... 12 countries here, you see the member countries here, Australia, Canada, China, France, the Netherlands, India, Italy, uh, New Zealand for the moment, South Africa, Spain, Sweden and the UK. And uh, then we have some African partner countries uh, for later on where they're going to extend the array into other parts of Africa. So it's going to be built on three different sites, if you like. So there's a component which is going into South Africa. So here, there's a component which is going into Australia. And then there's the global headquarters, which is at Jodrell Bank in the UK. So a truly global project. Um, and the SKA itself is seeking new partners. There's around 600 engineers and scientists around the world who've been working on the design of this instrument for the last, oh God, it seems like forever, um, maybe eight years. Uh, the project itself was actually conceived of in 1991. So as with things like the, the Large Hadron Collider and... Uh, the gravitational wave detectors that we have, Virgo and LIGO, it takes a long time to conceive of an idea and then actually get it up and running. So 20 to 30 years is not unusual. So 1991 was when this, this project started. All right. So I wanted to sort of take a step back and talk about how we got to where we got to with the SKA. So 1991, um, astronomers went to a conference much like this one and they sat around and they thought... What do we need to do in the next 20 years to remain cutting edge in radio astronomy? What, what kind of instrument do we need to have? And they came up with this concept uh, of a telescope which had one square collecting area um, for collecting radiation from, from the universe. So that's where the name comes from. Square kilometre array is not the size 
uh, the land that we're going to put the telescope in. It's the surface collecting area of all of the dishes. And then they said, well, where do we want to put it? And so in order to um, have a place which is good for radio astronomy, you want to have a number of things. So you want to have low interference. So you want to stay away from people. People produce enormous amounts of spurious electromagnetic radiation. Um, just to illustrate that, how many of you have on you a Wi-Fi device? Hands up. Excellent. 100% in the room. How many of you have more than one? How many of you have more than three? Oh, yeah. See? A fair number of you. Okay. So I, I actually have three mobile phones plus my computer. So I've got four Wi-Fi emitting devices. And those things spew out enormous amounts of electromagnetic radiation. So your mobile phone produces 10,000 times more power than the most powerful uh, source in space that we're trying to detect. So if you take your mobile phone anywhere near a radio telescope, you will saturate it. You will make it impossible to do radio astronomy. So, low interference, away from people. You want to have a stable ionosphere. So one of the problems that we have with radio astronomy is that uh, as the radio waves come through our ionosphere, uh, they scintillate, so they twinkle, just like optical starlight. And that makes it harder to actually image, and so you don't want that. You'd ideally not have to, you don't want to build primary infrastructure, you want it to be present. You don't want to be building roads and power stations, although we did end up building roads and power stations, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you want it to be roughly flat, and you want to have a good view of the sky. And what we define to be a good view of the sky is we want to be able to see the centre of our galaxy, the Milky Way. All right, so what happens when you do that? So here's the first criterion. So this map at the top here, this is a, a satellite map of optical light pollution uh, of the Earth, and you can see, you know, Central Europe, Japan, look, Japan with all those neon lights, um, and the east coast of the United States, obviously... Uh, very, very high population density places, lots of lights, bad places for optical telescopes. Unsurprisingly, if you go into the radio band, and this is an image made, again, with a satellite at 131 megahertz, you see uh, exactly the same thing. So this part of the US, Europe, ablaze with people emitting in the radio band. And so you don't want to be anywhere near those places. Although I have to say that LOFAR, the first uh, telescope that I actually worked on, which is the largest radio telescope uh, in the world at the moment, and is a low-frequency telescope, is built there in the Netherlands. Yes, yes, you might wonder why people are looking confused. Ask me when I'm not being recorded. Um, okay, so we've, we've ruled that out. Uh, you also want to be able to see the Milky Way, which means you don't want to be in the Northern Hemisphere, you want to be in the Southern Hemisphere. And this uh, blue line here is the region of total electron content variation which is high due to the ionosphere. So you want to stay below that blue line. So we want to, now we've restricted us quite a lot down here. And these are high population density places where there's bad pollution, so you don't want to be there. So we ended up with two possible sites. This took six years. So, <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't seem like it would take six years, but it did. Um, and we had an international search process, and so we narrowed it down to two sites uh, in South Africa and Australia, and then they went head to head for a competition to host the entire observatory, which uh, was an interesting process. And what we came up with in the end was that we wouldn't have them go head to head. We would have uh, parts of the array built here and parts of the array built there. All right, and New Zealand was involved in the bid process. So originally when we went head to head, Australia and New Zealand actually had a combined bid where this was gonna be the center of the telescope and we we're gonna build it out across Australia into New Zealand. But uh, in the process that we went through the down select where we decided to put part here and part there. That, that didn't pan out. All right, so two parts of the telescope. So the first one is called SKA MID, and um, it's this dish-based array. This is going to operate at gigahertz frequencies, so this is the one where your mobile phone will truly wreck it. Uh, and there's going to be 130 to 133 dishes spread out over 120 to 150 kilometers. It's going to be located here in the Karoo, which is 800 kilometers north of Cape Town. Um, it's in a region of South Africa, which is now protected legally by something called the Astronomy Advantage Act. And um, each of these dishes here is going to send 10 gigabits per second to the central computer on site, which is called the Correlator. So this is the uh, area over which the telescope will be built. So there's a few small towns. Carnarvon's the largest. I think there's only 10,000 people in Carnarvon. And this is the core site here, so we're going to build it out over this area. And this is protected um, 
uh, under the South African uh, Astronomy Advantage Act. And later on, uh, these are the other possible sites of building phase two of the SK if that happens out into other parts of Africa. So SK Low. So this is the one that's going in Australia. Um, the site here is called the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory, and it's where the MWA telescope currently sits. Um, we're going to have between 121 and 130,000 dipoles, large number, spread out over 40 to 65 kilometres. Um, Perth is here, and so like in South Africa, it's 800 kilometres away from Perth. Perth's where the, the images are actually going to be made, so data actually comes from uh, the site here down the National Broadband Network to Perth um, and is then processed. Uh, this is a previous generation of the possible dipoles that we're going to use. So we're going to have them in collections. So we're going to put a collection of 256 dipoles together. It's called a station. There's going to be 512 stations, or 476, depending on which of these numbers we end up with, which is a question of money. Right, so I want to talk about the MRO. So the MRO actually is in existence. It's, it's been running as an observatory now uh, for seven years. And so it's a region of 127 square kilometres here in Western Australia. It's actually protected, again, under Australian law, so you can't emit uh, spurious radio signals in that area. And then there's a coordination zone, which is 260 kilometres in radius. It's a huge piece of land for which, if you want to broadcast in the radio spectrum, you have to get permission. So this is the most protected radio site on Earth. So this is designed to be pristine to allow us to observe the sky and the radio spectrum without any uh, interference from humans, or as, at least as, as little as possible. Um, to give you some comparison, this is the size, the observatory itself is the size of the Netherlands. There are, I think, 22 to 23 million people living in the Netherlands. There are 110 people living there. So it's three nano people per square kilometre. It's a good measure. Um, so data comes down uh, from the site along the coast down to Perth. Geraldton's the nearest town, and that's still four hours' drive. You can actually fly up. There's, a, there's two airstrips up here. You can fly up in about an hour and a half. All right, so just to speak to this point around interference, so this is the radio spectrum. Uh, this is 10, this is in uh, mega, no, this is in hertz. So this is 100 megahertz. This is a gigahertz. This is Sydney, and all this stuff here is junk, which means we can't observe anything. This is Narrabri, where the telescope that I use for my PhD is, and now you pretty much can't use that either. And this is close to the MWA site, to the, to the MRO. So this is the thermal background here, and you can see there's a few pieces of uh, the spectrum where there's interference, but not much. It's basically clean. So that's why we, we picked there. All right. So that's, that's the SK. That's the concept. So we're going to have thousands of dishes, oh, sorry, hundreds of dishes in South Africa, thousands of dipoles, in Australia. And so you can ask, well, how will this be better than the current radio telescopes that we have? And so that's what this infographic is supposed to uh, explain. So resolution. So we worry about three things with telescopes. We worry about resolution, survey speed, and sensitivity. So the resolution of the SKA is going to be slightly better than, than LOFAR, which is the telescope I told you about in the Netherlands. And it's going to be four times better than the, the VLA um, at mid-frequencies. So the VLA is the current best uh, dish-based telescope in the world. It's in the US. So if you've watched the movie Contact, you've seen Jodie Foster with the headphones. That's the VLA. Yeah. Okay. So you see better. You see this is what the SK will do. Higher resolution. Um, sensitivity, which means you can see further back into the history of the universe. Uh, in this case, SK low is going to be eight times better than LOFAR. So that's a huge improvement and five times better than the JVLA. So we'll be able to see fainter things. And because the speed of light is finite, that actually means that we're seeing further back into the history of the universe. So astronomy is like archaeology. So the, the longer it's taken light to get to us, the older it is, and therefore it's like seeing layers of the universe. So this is important if you want to understand the history of the universe. And then this one is survey speed. So how fast can we survey the sky? So these images, these circles, are actually showing you the field of view of different radio telescopes. So this is LOFAR at low frequencies, and this is the VLA at mid frequencies, or gigahertz frequencies. So this is like, I don't know, 30 megahertz up to 300 megahertz-ish, and this is in the gigahertz. And so you can see they're very small. This is the field of view of SKA mid, so you're supposed to compare this circle to that circle, and this is the field of view of SKA low. 
And what that means is that if you are trying to survey the sky, remember I said we wanted to make a movie, um, you want to have a very big field of view. So survey speed is important. So SKLO, 135, 135 times the speed of LOFAR and 60 uh, the speed of the JVLA for surveying the sky. Now, this is important because for the sort of first 70 years of, of radio astronomy, we thought that the radio universe was relatively static, that things did not change on human lifetimes. This turns out not to be true. There are things that bling on and off in the radio spectrum, um, which we've only recently discovered in the last decade. And so if you want to do transient radio science, if you want to see these things that switch on and switch off rapidly, you need to survey the sky very quickly. And this is what our colleagues in the optical fields are doing as well. So this is kind of exciting. It's a new area of astronomy. Um, all right, this is just collection area. So this is, these are all the ra major radio telescopes in the world, starting at low frequencies at this end and going through to high frequencies at this end. And uh, the size of the circle is proportional to the collecting area, which is proportional in some sense to how sensitive they are. And so what you can see here is, this is wrong for the MWA, I'm just gonna say it should be like twice that. Um, but you can see they're quite small compared to what SK low will do, so it's so big that you can't actually put it here. On the, on the slide. So that's just another thing saying that it's going to be, the SK is going to be very sensitive. So this is SK mid here. It's going to dominate this area of frequency space and SK low will dominate this area of frequency space. At high frequencies, uh, the SK is not uh, covering those areas. So we'll still be reliant on instruments like ALMA to cover very high frequencies. If you know about astronomy, ALMA's in Chile. All right. I want to talk about a couple of the uh, science cases that we have for SK and why we're doing it. So it's all very well and good to build radio telescopes and um, use them to do science, but it's better if you know why. So this is a graphic which is illustrating the entire history of our universe, uh, starting here at the Big Bang and going through the present, present epoch. So this is 13.7-ish million, sorry, billion years. And so the universe, the Big Bang happened, there was a period of rapid expansion and in this particular phase, the universe was ionized. So we had uh, protons and electrons uh, being separated. As the universe expanded and cooled, those things came back together. At some point, the first uh, stars and galaxies formed and they emitted radiation which caused ionization to happen around them. So these areas here, uh, where there's ionization happening around these first stars and galaxies, we don't actually know when the first stars and galaxies formed. This is in a period called the epoch of reionization. So this is neutral parts of the universe and these are ionized holes in the universe. And it turns out that we can actually detect that through observations of hydrogen. So hydrogen, if you leave it sit still for about 10 to the seven years, so 10 million years, it will emit a photon at a particular frequency. It's called a spin flip transition. So what happens is um, you've got two energy states for hydrogen. So you've got a proton, an electron, and if they're uh, spin is aligned, you've got a higher energy state. If the spin is anti-aligned, you've got a lower energy state. And if hydrogen is just sitting there for 10 million years, it will spontaneously um, emit a photon at a particular frequency which corresponds to the difference in those two energy states. Now, this is at 1420 megahertz in the rest frequency, which would mean that, you know, if it was happening today, you would want to observe at 1420 megahertz. However, this is happening somewhere between 400 and 700 million years uh, after the Big Bang, so about 13 billion years ago, and since then the universe has expanded. And that cosmological expansion of the universe has actually redshifted this um, signal into the low frequency part of the spectrum. So we're going to look for this with low frequency radio telescopes, with the dipole telescopes, to see where it actually occurs in frequency space. So that tells us exactly the first stars and galaxies formed. So it's sort of like Swiss cheese. So we should be able to image um, this Swiss cheese with the SKA. And that'll tell us when the first stars formed. The other thing, this is one of the things I work on, this is the cosmic web. So um, galaxies are not distributed uniformly throughout the universe. Galaxies form a web-like structure called the cosmic web. So if you are God, if you believe in God, I don't, but let's imagine for the purpose of the exercise, and you stepped out of the universe and looked in, what you would see is this sort of filamentary structure so this is a simulation done by my colleague Franco Vassa in uh, Bologna in Italy. And so these are actually galaxy clusters. So these are groupings of uh, thousands of galaxies, hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And these are the filamentary structures in between them which contain gas and dust and magnetic fields and, and other galaxies. This is actually real data. 
This is a mapping of, uh, I think, 500,000 galaxies in terms of their uh, position and distance from us. Uh, so this is taken with an optical telescope, and it's out to a redshift of, of 0.1. And so you can actually see this filamentary structure. You can see this cosmic web. We can see it in the distribution of galaxies. What we can't see is we can't see this gas and magnetic fields directly. And so one of the things that we hope to do with the SK is actually detect it. We, do, we hope to detect radio emission generated from electrons spiraling in the magnetic fields in between uh, these threads of the cosmic web. This is extraordinarily faint. This is really, really, really hard to do. And so um, it's one of the great sort of challenging pieces of work to be done with the SKA. We tried to do it with current radio telescopes. I have a PhD student working on it at the moment, and uh, he's, he's been working on it for two years. And we were really excited that we might be able to do it statistically with the MWA, with the current telescope. He sent me an email last week and said, ah, oh, Melanie, very, very sad to tell you that I've done all the simulation work now and it's going to be impossible to do it with the current radio telescope. We'll have to wait for the SKA. So he's very depressed, but I was, I was excited. I was like, it's all right, we're going to build a new telescope. It'll be fun. Um, oh, that hasn't come out very well, has it? This is, again, the cosmic web. Uh, sorry about the resolution. These are clusters of galaxies. I work on galaxy clusters. Uh, and so these are groupings of, of hundreds to thousands of galaxies held together uh, around a gravitational well, so they're orbiting around a, a common gravitational centre. One of the other things that we can do is they smash into each other periodically on the order of a few giga years. So the universe is, is 13 billion years old on the order of a couple of giga years. They smash into each other. When they do that, you get very energetic shock waves that go out into the universe. So these, these shock waves are, in fact the most energetic thing since the Big Bang. So hundreds of light years across, shockwave goes out, it piles up all the magnetic fields along the way, it causes all the electrons to rotate around those magnetic fields, and that gives rise to synchrotron emission, which we happen to detect in the radio. So one of the things you can do is you can look at merging galaxy clusters like this one, and you can actually try and find those shockwaves. And so this uh, was, again, work done in New Zealand, actually, by my former student, Sarah Shakuri. And this is seven telescopes worth of data being put together here. It's from X-ray through radio. And this blue stuff is, is showing one of these shock waves. So you can look for them. So these are the most energetic things since the Big Bang. When I started my PhD, I think we knew of 20 of them. And now we've got about 200. When we go to the SKA, we should see probably of the order of 5,000. And so then you can start to do statistical cosmology. It's kind of fun. All right. Now. Now I want to scare you with the data rates. So those are the two telescopes that we're going to build in South Africa and in Australia. Um, so the one in South Africa, the Dish Array, 350 megahertz up to 14 gigahertz. Uh, as I said, we've revised this down now. It's 130 dishes. Uh, it's going to produce about two terabytes of raw data per second, and that's going to go down to about 62 exabytes of data per year. That's the raw data. Um, that's you know, that's enough to fill 340,000 laptops uh, every day. That's not too bad. That's, that's a big data problem, but it's not this big data problem. So the telescope that's going in Australia, 130,000 antennas, is going to produce 157 terabytes of raw data per second. That's going to be ingested into a computer on site and turned into correlated, we call them visibilities, uh, so that's close to five zettabytes of data per year. So that's five times the global internet traffic of 2015. This is a big data problem. This we're going to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't, don't tell me about your Google data problems or anything like that. This is a big data problem. So 35,000 DVDs every second. This instrument, we're going to then convert those data into images. For both telescopes, we're going to produce about a petabyte of imaging data per day, which then has to be stored. We want to operate this thing for 50 years. So petabyte of imaging data per telescope per day for 50 years to do science. That's a big data problem. All right. The compute that we need to do this does not yet exist. When they came up with these numbers, with these statistics, and, and this sort of stuff hasn't actually changed very much in the last decade, we were a long way from, from compute being able to deal with it. We're not that far now. Thanks to, I mean, they kind of gambled on Moore's Law, which I know isn't um, completely accurate now, but they gambled on compute increasing, and we're about a factor or two away now from being able to do this. So 
hopefully we'll be able to do it by the time we actually build the telescope. All right. So it would be silly to go from where we are now to that, which is a jump of 100 in, in sort of telescope power without going through some uh, you know, intermediate steps. So we have precursor telescopes. So these are small-scale demonstrators um, that are next-generation radio telescopes built on the two SKA sites, and they carry out SKA-related activities. And that's everything from operations to science uh, to instrumental design, everything. So there are four of them. So Meerkat and Hera, which are in South Africa, on the South African site in the Karoo, and ASCAP and MWA, which are in Australia. And here's what they look like. So Meerkat is this offset Gregorian. Meerkat is actually going to be built into SKA mid, so we're going to add extra antennas to that for it to go uh, be part of SKA mid. Hera is a, an experiment to detect the epoch of reionization that I've talked to you about, so finding the first stars and galaxies. ASCAP is a, an imaging telescope with um, what's called a phased array feed, that thing there. Uh, so instead of looking up at the sky and measuring a particular single voltage or having a single pixel, if you like, this thing has a checkerboard of um, dipoles up here which allow you to use it like a radio camera. So it uh, has a very wide field of view. So it's a phase array feed. So this is an imaging instrument which is in Australia, next door to my telescope, and this is my telescope, the MWA. Spider sort of dipole thing. So these two telescopes are in uh, commissioning. So uh, Meerkat has 64 antennas, ASCAP has 36. Uh, Hera is still in construction. The MWA has been operating since 2012. So we are the first operational SK precursor telescope, and we've recently been upgraded. So I'm going to talk about the MWA as an example. So the MWA is a, is a low-frequency radio telescope. Um, it operates between 50, no, sorry, 70 and 300 megahertz. Um, it's operated by a consortium of 21 institutions from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, China, uh, the US and Japan. And um, it's got a very large field of view. So remember I said that that was important for survey speed, so 30 by 30 degrees. Um, we finished it in November 2012 and commissioning finished on the 20th of June 2013. I know because I had to sign a piece of paper. I used to be chair of the board. So I signed this piece of paper to say commissioning was finished. Um, it started with 2,000 antennas spread out over about three kilometres. And in 2017, we upgraded it. So now we've got 4,096 antennas spread out over five kilometres, and it's on the SKA site, which is here. And um, this expansion is known as phase two. And it's comprised largely of SKA member countries. So these are all of our partners. Um, it's the, the land that we built the telescope on, the Murchison Radio Observatory, is uh, the traditional land of the Wadri Yamaji people. And so they gave the telescope a name, uh, Gulgamanu, which means big ear thing. Um, and so that's, that's what that is. They're all our partners. All right. I want to talk about scientific niches for the MWA. So big field of view. So this is the whole sky uh, as seen by a radio telescope at 4 or 8 megahertz. This is the field of view of the MWA. So this is a single MWA image. So you can imagine that it's really easy to put lots of those all over the sky relatively quickly. So we use the MWA to survey the sky rapidly to look for these radio sources that switch on and off. Um, it's very good at detecting this diffuse large-scale structure. So this is our galaxy, the Milky Way, running through here, okay? This is called the North Spur, so you can see spurs of emission. This is synchrotron radiation, so this is actually mapping magnetic fields and electrons in our galaxy. Um, this diffuse stuff, the MWA, it was, at the time, uh, the most sensitive telescope to that uh, ever built at low frequencies. It's very good at uh, mapping the galactic plane, which is what these figures are about. I'm not going to go into detail about those. But what it does have is it's also very good at uh, having good spectral coverage. So this is a particular radio source. This is frequency. This is intensity. And previous telescopes, these are individual points from individual telescopes. If you're trying to understand the structure of this, it's really, really hard just to do with three points. The MWA gives you 20. So we have good spectral coverage. So that allows us to do um, things that you wouldn't be able to do with other telescopes. Now, the image I showed you right at the start, the galactic plane with the blue and the supernova remnants and the gas and everything, the only reason that we can do that, with, that was all done with the MWA in a single band, is because we have this very fine spectral coverage. So we can distinguish emission types in band without having to resort to multiple telescopes, which is a unique feature at the moment. OK, let's get through that. So this is what it looks like. Oh, I've got to go over here. So this is a flyover um, of, of the telescope. So we arrange the tiles so that these, each of these things is a dipole, so two uh, 
metal sort of spider things where we've got um, the electronics sit in the middle and there are four by four of those on a ground plane and then there are 256 of these things which are called tiles. So this, this drone footage is going to fly out over it so you can get an idea. And each of these things, uh, electronic boxes here, allows us to steer the telescope in a certain direction. So there's no moving parts for the MWA. So unlike a dish where you have to steer it and have metal and motors and things, we do this with timing. So if you can imagine the flat surface of, of those dipoles, if we want to point it in this direction, radiation will come in, it'll hit the front surface of the, the dipoles first, we'll hold that radiation, so we'll buffer it, and then when the rest of it hits the other side, we, we then add them together coherently to form a direction. Um, if we could afford it, we could look at multiple different directions at once. So each of these each of these boxes here is basically doing that. So if you can imagine, I want to look at something up here. The plane waves come down. They hit this side of the, of the tile first. We put that into memory buffer. When they hit that side, and a few nanoseconds later, we then add the signals together so that they're coherent. If we put, you know, if we had enough money, we could put hundreds of these boxes all around the thing and just steer it into multiple different directions at once, but we can't. Lofar, the telescope that I worked on in the Netherlands, works exactly the same, except they have eight different directions that they look at simultaneously. Okay. So, challenges. So the SKA has been described as the largest ICT project in the world. Fundamentally, it's a telescope. I just want to remind people that, because people in New Zealand got very excited about it being an ICT project. It's still a telescope. You still have to do science with it. Um, but there are a number of challenges. So first of all, scalability of imaging algorithms. So if we're going to have that much data, you need to be able to turn your current imaging algorithms into something that can deal with data at that, that data rate. Um, we need to have large-scale automated pipelines to be able to extract knowledge from those data, just like you do with anything else, but on a scale which nobody else has at the moment. We need to have storage and retrieval systems that can handle data that's coming in, being ingested at that kind of rate and going out at that rate. And we need to have data curation and comparison, which we don't have and no one's working on at the moment, to be able to extract knowledge not only from within the data from the SK itself, but in comparison to other instruments. So those are our main challenges. So scalability. So the wide fields that we're now looking at, so those larger fields of view, represent challenges that we haven't had before in radio astronomy. So we've been looking at very narrow fields of view before. If you look at a narrow field of view, you can assume that it's flat that you're essentially dealing with something that the ionosphere is regular across and that it's a flat plane on the sky. If you start looking at something like this, then you have to worry about the curvature. So the looming issue is how to deal with that. So the fields are so large they can't be approximated as flat, so you need to understand projection and spherical imaging. The ionosphere is distorting your waves in different ways across your field of view, so you've now got to solve for a structured ionosphere over your field of view which leads to what we call direction-dependent effects. Um, and these larger fields of view require huge amounts of data, so there's lots of pixels. So we're talking like 50,000 by 50,000 pixels in a single image. So this needs HPC to process. But the traditional imaging algorithms that we have, they don't scale. So we've had to come up with new imaging algorithms. For this that I did recently, um, Luke is an expat Kiwi who's now in Toronto. Um, so this is a piece of work on uh, a new algorithm to deal with this projection problem. And so it's one thing to write the algorithms. What we found, though, is that so that's step one. Step two, which is often missed, is making them efficient. So radio astronomers can write algorithms to make new images. Radio astronomers cannot write efficient algorithms to put them on HPC architecture to make them run at scale. This is a problem. So we've had lots of new algorithms come up with. Not all of them go onto the HPC. So we need to work with people with HPC backgrounds to be able to do this, or we need to have people who are radio astronomers with an HPC background. I know of three. Luke is one of them. So we actually did do this. We, we did the second part where we uh, wrote a paper on implementing it, how to actually do it at, at scale. This doesn't normally happen. And this is a human problem. So this is my graphic to try and explain why this is a human problem. So radio astronomers, like me, when I started, we care about the universe. We don't necessarily care about some of these other problems. And so, and, and you know, you can argue, nor should we. We're not, we're not experts in these things. Um, so in the past, this is my sort of graphic to try to display the history of radio astronomy. So old telescopes like the JVLA, the Compact Array, the GBRT, these are telescopes I used as a PhD student. They had, you know, of the order of gigabyte images, you could run them on your PC, the standard implementation. So astrophysicists could write your code. 
So here we've got software efficiency uh, and effective software design, so it's not very effective or efficient. Cool. So it can be done by astronomers. This is the age that we're currently in with telescopes like the MWA. So our, our sizes are gigabyte size images, and they're running on compute clusters. We need to have parallel implementations, and so you need to have them be slightly more efficient and effective, and you need to have more knowledge of computer science than astronomy to be able to do that than we did in the past. But for the SKA, we're dealing with terabyte images running on machines yet to be built, and we have to use architecture-specific implementations. So we need software engineers to be able to do this. We can't have radio astronomers do this. It drives me nuts when people say, ah, what we'll do is we'll just get a whole bunch of ex-radio astronomers and we'll get them to write this stuff here. No, we will not. It will not work. We'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and it won't work. We can't do that. The other problem that we have, and this really is a human problem, is people become wedded to the way of doing things that they want to do things. So I'm trained to deconvolve data in a particular way. It's called cleaning. It's very old-fashioned. Um, and so radio astronomers, when they're faced with this problem, they, say, they don't say, how can we work with HPC specialists to improve scalability and performance using the HPC architecture? They say, how can we mush the HPC architecture to fit with our old way of thinking and our old way of imaging? Also not a good thing to do. But that's a human problem. So this is, this is one of these interesting things I saw Dougal's keynote um, on the first day of the meeting talking about issues around people changing the way that they think and the way that they do things. And this is exactly an example of this, which we see everywhere. We have to get people to adopt new ways of thinking and working together. So we need to work with the HPC community, definitely. So need to work beyond uh, radio astronomers for data processing solutions. Pipelines. So the data rates that we're dealing with require us to have pipelines. Um, and this drives us to have automatic data reduction pipelines. We can't do this bespoke data reduction anymore. This is actually the MWA data flow. So all of the stuff here in this blue box here is on the site at the MRO. So we've got the tiles, we've got the receiver, we've got our, our polyphase filter banks, the correlator, which adds all of the signals together to start with. We have an online archive, which just buffers stuff, and then we send it down via 10 gigabits a second link to some front-end servers and our archive in Pawsey. So this is all at the Pawsey Supercomputing Center in Perth. So this is sent, um, what is it, 800 kilometers? Uh, down to Perth, and then we process it down here in Perth, and then we serve it out via a data po portal to all of the astronomers around the world. That's how SKA will work as well. Um, but we need to do it automatically. So the SKA data pipeline is going to look like this. So you've got your correlator, which is going to be on site. There's ingest, there's calibration, there's imaging, there's some science, and then there's an archive. So it's a 200 to 300 petaflop system. The dish array is going to put in about two terabytes per second. The low frequency array in Australia is going to put in about seven. So it's average about four terabytes per second. As I said before, it produces a petabyte of imaging data a day. Now, if you want to store a petabyte of imaging data a day on both sites, that's 100 million euros a year in storage you have to pay for. That seems like a bad idea to me too, for a telescope that only costs 100 million, years, sorry, 100 million euros a year to operate. So we've got two problems. We've got a search volume and we've got a storage cost. And so we need to think more creatively about extracting knowledge um, and what are we keeping. So it turns out it's not just a challenge to make the images. Once you've got them, what do you do with them? Who's going to do the science with them? So an SKA continuum image will look like this. So hopefully at the back you can see lots of grey stuff with a few black bits. So the grey stuff is empty pixels. The black stuff is the sources. They're, they're the, the radio sources that we're interested in. So an image cube for the SK is going to be about 50,000 by 50,000 pixels, and roughly 1% of those pixels corresponds to information that we care about. If you save all of this, you have to spend 100 million euros a year. What's worse is we don't do it at one frequency. We're going to do it at 65,000 frequencies. So we're actually going to make data cubes. So we point our telescope, we get a data cube. So 50,000 pixels by 50,000 pixels by 65,000 channels gives you 1.6 times 10 to the 14 voxels, of which most of it is noise. Why do we want to keep noise in perpetuity? This, this again, is a human problem. So when I, sh when I say to my radio astronomy colleagues, well, why don't we just do things like this? We'll do some source finding, we'll find this thing here, we'll just extract this, you know, not, not a postage stamp exactly, but a postage tube through our data cube and throw the rest of it away. They say, oh, but what if we've missed something? Well, what if we have? We can't afford to keep it all. So this is, this is an interesting sociological thing because when I started my PhD 20 years ago, I was told 
the worst thing you can do is point the telescope at the wrong part of the sky. Running the telescope is extremely expensive. Keeping the archive is very cheap. So what we were supposed to do was make sure that we collected the data once and put it in an archive. In the era of the SKA, it's the reverse. Reobserving is very cheap. Keeping the stuff is extremely expensive. But getting people to shift that mindset is very, very hard. So you can think of the sky as an archive. So as long as you're not dealing with those transient sources that blink on and off continuously, if you're worried about the vast majority of radio sources which only change on scales longer than human lifetimes, just reobserve it if you've missed it. Don't try and spend 100 million euros a year keeping data which you're then not even going to go through anyway. So that's, that's my personal view. Here's an example of this as well. So I said 65,000 channels. This is observations taken with the ASCAP telescope uh, in Australia. So this is uh, the source that they were looking at here. Uh, this is frequency. So what they were doing was they were looking for an absorption feature. That's it there. They measured 1,000 different channels. And if I blow it up, here it is here. It sits over less than 20. So why would you keep the whole thing? Why? I don't understand. We don't have tools to be able to find these things and just extract them. So this is, a, this is an interesting problem space to be in. OK, I'm going to go back to the first computers that we had uh, in astronomy. So this is how we did it 100 years ago. So these are human computers. They are at Harvard. They are women whose jobs it was to look at uh, astronomical plates and write down on a ledger where the interesting objects were. So they're using human brains to detect and curate and write things down. We're still doing this. This is a problem. We can't do this at this scale. So I've only got five minutes left, so I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but this is the Gleam survey that we did on the MWA. So this is three quarters of the sky. Uh, this is the galactic plane. The thing I showed you at the start is a zoom in of here. So there are 300,000 galaxies um, in this image. So every little dot you see here, that's a galaxy with a supermassive black hole. Now, we didn't count them by hand. We used a thresholding algorithm. You guys are computer scientists, so I'm not going to explain to you how a thresholding algorithm works. But what I'm going to say is that thresholding algorithms do a terrible job of things which are fuzzy and diffuse and hard to detect if you've you know, got occlusions or you're only slightly above the noise. But our eyes can see them. So if we zoom through here, we're going to zoom in. We're going to zoom in again. I'm going to put it in one radio color instead of three. That's a supernova remnant. You take your threshold. Thresholding algorithm finds that really easily. This is a radio galaxy. So radio galaxies have an optical source here and two jets. So you've got a supermassive black hole in the middle. It's flinging out electrons close to the speed of light. They're accelerating in the magnetic field and giving rise to radio emission. So that's what this is. This pink stuff is radio emission. So you need to understand what a radio galaxy looks like. That's a really bright one. That's easy to see. Thresholding algorithm probably put nice lines around that and you'd find it. OK, what about that one? Can you see that at the back? Can you see that it's got a bright core and two very fuzzy lobes? Yes? Yeah. Right. How, do you, how well do you think a thresholding algorithm does all that? That's what a thresholding algorithm does. It misses stuff. But your eyes can see it. So we went through, those are my research group from New Zealand actually, and we picked up all the things the thresholding algorithm missed. It took a year. So I had four people work on this for a year. Now, with the SKA, if we redo that survey, there's going to be 360,000 times more data. Nobody's going to give me that many research assistants to do it by eye, which is why we have to do it automatically. So we've been working on algorithms to do this. So there's our radio galaxy. There's the thresholding algorithm. And there's the new algorithm that we worked on here in New Zealand. So we can actually now automatically find these fuzzy things at a level of 1.2 sigma off the RMS noise, which is kind of cool. Um, trouble is, even if you find that, how do you tell a machine that all those things are the one object? At this size, this size, different sizes of the image, different brightness, that's a challenge. We're also working in the era of multi-messenger astrophysics, so we don't just do astronomy with one telescope or even one uh, modality. So we use gamma rays, we use x-rays, we use gravitational waves, so this is a graphic showing you all sorts of different uh, astronomy observatories, so there's LIGO down there doing gravitational waves. These are all satellites above the Earth. Um, these are Cherenkov telescopes. So we need interoperable data retrieval and comparison systems. 
I discovered astronomers are quite good at this, but we're not at the level that you would like to be to deal with this level of data flow. We need data curation and semantics to match across all these facilities. Nobody's actually working on that particularly much at the moment. So when the SK switches on, even in stage delivery, we're going to do it in four stages, we will have more data than we know what to do with. We will be like this dog trying to take a drink. Not very useful. But what we need to do is we need to use our precursors to develop these new algorithms, to test these new uh, processes so that we can get to science dramatically faster because ultimately we want to go from unstructured data here to structured data which leads to knowledge. Oops. How do I go back? So, in summary, we're due to start construction on this telescope at the end of next year. I'll say the start of 2021. Early science ops are in 2025. Seems to be very close to me these days, although not close enough for some people. Um, this is a project which will be a platform for research and industry collaboration, as well as for governments to invest in ICT. But remember, it's a telescope, so we want to do science. Um, but we need to do a number of things. So we need computationally efficient, scalable imaging algorithms on HPC. We have to work with HPC specialists to be able to do that and make them run. We need automatic pipelines to create knowledge and extract knowledge. So we need smart processes to get information out of big data, which is a problem not just for me, but for many other fields. We need to have interoperable storage and retrieval and comparison systems. And finally, and I didn't get to talk about this, we need better visualization and human interaction software. We also need more people. We've got a lot of people, but they're not working on this stuff. So if you're interested, do come and talk to me. And I think that the interesting thing about projects like this is that they're exciting because we get to learn about the universe and they inspire people, but they also provide potential solutions for other fields and are applicable to other big data projects. So I hope that you know we're going towards a data-driven future and that we're going to have better record keeping and digital curation, which is the thing you guys do, better patent, patent, re patent recognition and scalable solutions. Any big data project needs those things, the SKA more desperately than others, but hopefully working on that will solve some of these things for other fields. So that will get us to a data-connected future, which I'm very excited about. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are on time? Yes, thanks a lot. Very fascinating. Very fascinating. Really <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Um, and now I open the floor for questions. Cool. I got a cool present. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, so I've been working in Chile for five, six years. Ah, and as cool. you know, astronomy is a big, big it deal is. there, right? Uh, so they're working on LST at the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. And they also present similar sorts of challenges. So I was yeah, wondering about, if you... about a tenth of the data rate, though. But yes, <laughs> so still, it's still a lot of data, right? It is, yes, even, definitely. So. Um, and I was wondering if, if you could talk about how how much connection there is between such projects, how much reuse of yep. of techniques, and maybe data if you, integration of data across these different sites. Yeah. Here. So the, the integration of data um, is something that has been talked about at the very high level between the SK and LSST, but I don't think anyone's actually done anything tangible on it at this stage. So a lot of the um, process that they have around transient sources will be, will be similar, but these questions around how to actually set up interoperable and searchable systems I don't think have been really addressed, but we keep having joint LSST, SKA meetings. LSST is going to go online before SKA, so I think SKA is kind of at the stage where they're hoping you guys will fix it first and then we'll pick it up. But um, yeah, no, th this is exactly the sort of thing we need to do. We need to start working um, in real terms with people doing the same sort of problems in different parts of the spectrum. Thanks, Melanie. Um, great presentation as always. Um, it's really good to see you here at this conference. Can you comment about um, two things, virtual observatories and just to be scientific about this, um, Switch to science thing. Uh, constellations like Starlink, which must yeah. really worry you. Yeah, so virtual observatories. So, um, right, uh, so astronomers are very good at having uh, virtual observatories. So we now have the International Virtual Observatory uh, Project, which gives us standards for a whole bunch of different things. Um, so the MWA, for example, has uh, a data portal which is compliant with the uh, International Virtual Observatory standard. What I've found is that that's great, so you can take data from the MWA, you can overlay it with other things, but it doesn't do um, as much cross-matching and interrogation of the data as you might want. So you, you kind of, 
we're, we're leading the way in virtual observatories in a sense, but not investing enough in another sense. You really want to be able to have like a queryable database that says, um, sort of like Watson, <laughs> you know, if, if I have this and then I overlay it with this and this and this, what do I get and what are the weird things and things like that. And so we're still talking about those things, but we haven't got there yet, but it's certainly on the, on the agenda. Yes, and as for, yes, Constellation. Yeah, so satellites are a problem. So anytime you put satellites up and they're emitting... Um, and they travel you know, all over the sky, they produce radio interference. Um, one of the things that we can do with those is because the footprint of the satellite is understood and because the, um, the, the, the digital spectrum of the satellite is understood, you can do something called adaptive nulling, which just means you can pull it out. But it's not computationally efficient to do so, so probably that's bad for astronomy. Uh, one of my friends is about to model what that's going to do for MWA, in fact. So... Yes, this is one of these issues that as we go forward in astronomy, we're getting into a space where even if we find places like the MRO and define them on the, on the surface of the Earth as being protected, the sky is not protected, so it's a problem. Hi, thank you also, um, Jerome Osnat from Ineria. My question is related to one comment that you made. Why, why would you preserve um, the noise uh, forever? Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering if you don't have, a, you, you don't think that you may have regret about uh, the, the solution that you take. Uh, for example, in biology, uh, for quite a long time, uh, uh, well, relatively small at the scale of what you're talking about, but uh, uh, people were not really interested in non coding region uh, uh, in the genomes, uh, places where there were not genes, but um, they take more and more importance because they can influence actually the decoding of uh, other regions, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So is it a totally uh, different problem or you may so that you may have regret at some time? Too? No, no, in fact it's not. So, I mean, it, this kind of comes back to the, the point that Dougal just made about uh, the environment. So if, if everything was static and you could completely collect your data again and it wasn't really changing on a life cycle that you, you know, were observing on, there would no, be no need to, to collect or, to, sorry, to, to not keep the data. Do you know what I mean? So what we find at the moment is, so the telescope that I used for my PhD was in uh, outside a town where there was only 12,000 people when I did my PhD. There's now 30,000 people there. We can't reobserve and collect the same information. So the fact that they did save all those data, we're going back and reprocessing it, either to get stuff that we didn't uh, think was interesting to start with, exactly like in, in biology, or because we've got better processing techniques that we can do that. If we could reobserve and get back the same quality data, then we wouldn't need to, to do that. So, um, again, it depends on the time scale of the phenomenon that you're looking at and whether or not you can collect the data to the same level of sensitivity and, and depth. And, and what Dougal's just described is something that scares the bejesus out of me as a radio astronomer because... I would happily keep all the data that we could, but not at 100 million euros a year for storage. Um, and so if we're going to pollute the uh, environment such that we can't go back and then get those same data, then yes, we would be better off keeping it. Hi, uh, Avi Bernstein, University of Zurich. I've had the great pleasure of using ASCAP data for the last two plus years. Uh, one cool. thing that, that I've found uh, interesting is that there is very little use of explicit knowledge in the processing so, you know, they're, they're, we do a lot of numerical things. We do, you, you do a lot of, anyway, a lot of really cool stuff in the, in the ASCAP processing pipeline. However, most of the knowledge is essentially either encoded deep into programs or in the astrophysicists' brains who are using this yep. program. Now, this community is really interested in the use of explicit representations of knowledge. So could you, could you tell us about how do you think could we use explicit knowledge in improving the SKA pipeline? Yeah, so um, this is a really interesting point. So you're using ASCAPsoft, and ASCAPsoft does a somewhat imperfect job of reducing ASCAP data. So my PhD students take the raw data and reduce it in their own pipelines so that they can uh, apply their, their own, um, I guess, quality controls. So one of the things that we're trying to do at the moment with both ASCAP and with the MWA, is to take this stuff that's in the astronomer's brain, the, the sort of the black belt astronomer stuff, and remove it so that we can get closer to automatic pipelines. So the MWA, for example, what we've done is we've released calibrated visibilities. Sorry if that doesn't make sense to everybody else, but basically it's taking out some of the, 
um, processing steps which remove sort of ionospheric and other effects so that they can go straight out to the community without having to have that black belt thing. And the SK is going to need the same thing. What I don't think we've been very good at is actually sitting down and encoding that information. Um, yeah, so you're nodding vigorously because I think this is exactly the problem. So one of the things with the MWA we're trying to do is, is precisely that, to say what is it that the black belt astronomer is doing and how can we put that into a pipeline? So if I compare the pipelines that I wrote when I was a graduate student to use the compact array versus what my students are doing now, there's less black belt stuff from my brain um, in the MWA pipeline than there was when I was doing it myself, but it's still not 100% there. We still have to work on that. So that's a very good point. How we do that, I don't know, but I think it's possible. All right, we have one last quick question here. Hi, so my name is Jonas Almeida. I'm at the National Cancer Institute. So we've noticed some of Alex Zali's students, you know, the, the worldwide virtual telescope. They are now starting to do work with us on pathology slides. And so my, my question is, do, do you see an opportunity to develop the software stack that goes to other disciplines? So it's not just astronomy, but so let's say it could go to whole slide imaging in pathology, for example? Yeah, I think so. I think any time where you've got uh, sufficient overlap in the outcomes and the process, you can do this. So I, I work with people who came from other parts of astronomy using completely different um, processing techniques from um, black body radiation, so from Planck satellites. So we're now applying their techniques to radio imaging. So I don't see why that can't go beyond... Um, astronomy itself and into other domains, particularly medical imaging, actually. A lot of the um, techniques used to make medical images are very similar to the techniques that we use to make uh, radio images, for example.